Well, it's great to be here. And um, yes, it was odd to appear in the comedy half hour slot. Hopefully, it won't feel like that again today. Um, the, uh, what I wanted to do, I know some of you uh, have been long in the field. Uh, some of you are new to the whole concept of linked data, uh, graph engines, uh, what's going on in that space. Um, so I thought, um, I was asked if I'd kind of tell a little bit of the history of how, uh, uh, how, how we perhaps got to where we are. Actually, my, really reflects kind of my journey through my academic career in, uh, in AI. Uh, as I said, I'm, I'm both uh, a head of house, as it's called, at, at Oxford, one of the colleges, but also a professor of computer science there. Moved there from Southampton three years ago. Um, and... Uh, uh, also uh, co-founded and chair still the Open Data Institute. So what I'm going to be talking about is th this concept is linked data as critical infrastructure. And it's not a done deal by any means, and I think we'll go through some of that history now uh, and see where we got to. So this is, this, <laughs> this is a terrible admission, but it's exactly 40 years ago that I went to do my PhD in AI at the Department of AI. There are some of my co yeah, I hope you can. Well, perhaps you can't spot me. <laughs> that kind of lineup of uh, hopeful PhD students. This was the. This was actually deep in the first AI winter. This was just post the Lighthill report. For people who know this stuff, they were pretty well closing down most AI research in the UK in 1978. As we arrived at the department, uh, about five years later, it had a massive renaissance and resurrection of money. As we all got terrified that the Japanese might solve the kind of general intelligent computing problem, so the so-called ICOP problem, fifth generation Japanese computing initiative, and their robots would take over the world and destroy all the jobs. Sound familiar? Uh, but back then, the world was a simpler place. There was one textbook on AI that we had, uh, which is a kind of staple set of notes. We were taught these exotic languages like POP2, which is kind of an interesting blend of uh, Algol-like and Lisp-like features. Um, we also, of course, were taught Prolog and Lisp back in those days. And kind of the, a big deal was made out of the fact your programming languages should have a, a clear... Uh, declarative semantics. Uh, well, I don't, I don't quite know where those sunny days have gone to. Um, because the world's become more complex, more heterogeneous in a certain sense, and there are many more parts to the software stack. But back in the day, um, the thought about how you built um, intelligent systems, understood the, 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 the cognitive abilities of humans, was very much rooted in a rule-based tradition. Um, and the rule-based tradition led kind of certainly to my, my early work. This was work I was doing in the 1980s, uh, building um, expert systems to uh, take a diagram on the left and turn it into a diagram on the right. Now, that's non-trivial because that's a process flow sheet. It's a logical specification for how you make a product, and that thing is arranged in three-dimensional space. You can tell it must be about 40 years old, the quality of the graphics. But there you are. It's a non-trivial task, but um, what we would do is we'd take, sit down the process engineers and, and, and decant, elicit the knowledge from them, and try and express the design knowledge as constraints and rules. Actually, constraint-based programming was a big part of this, as was frame-based or object-based uh, representations. Um, what we discovered in doing that, and it was a successful project, it was uh, um, ultimately this... this, this uh, um, the teaching company that we set up was acquired by a process control firm in America called Aspen Tech uh, to help them uh, lay out their, their, their three-dimensional um, uh, geometries, um, was that a lot of common sense knowledge that engineers had never appeared in the specification on the left. So actually we had to be things like you know, moving one liquid to another place very often can be done using gravity flow. If you put the containers high enough up, you can use gravity flow. That's not in the specification on the left. That's just common sense knowledge. So it was a, it was a very interesting experience to realize the limits of, um, of, 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 of formalization and where you had to fill in the gaps. Uh, and this is very much the trend. Again, in the 90s, we were doing stuff on search and rescue expert systems. This is a rule-based uh, planning system, work with Austin Tate at Edinburgh, on, uh, this was a search and rescue application. Um, and we'd look at it now, and it didn't recruit neural networks, it didn't use large amounts of machine learning. What it did was try and encapsulate in a set of process rules the kinds of things you do when you launch a search and rescue mission. And the kind of encapsulation of knowledge in those days was really, uh, as I say, based around logic-based representations um, of a, um, a well, prologue-like formalizations very often, rule-based, constraint-based representations, um, and that's where we were. 
And it was very much that tradition that I took down with me to Southampton when I began uh, in the department there in the early 2000s and began to be intrigued with this idea of, uh, of putting some of this AI knowledge representation that we developed into the web. You know, AI got the web very late. I often say this. We were just, you know, it was kind of like an application layer. It wasn't deeply interesting, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, and, and then as we dawned on us how this extraordinary construct was beginning to become, uh, in some sense, an interesting class of distri distributed knowledge base. Well, what could we do? It, what, what could we do to make it more like that? How could we inject semantics into the web at scale? And, and, the, and the work that uh, we began there, the great team of, 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 of researchers there, we were building some of the, the very first scalable uh, uh, triple stores, graph engines, the three store that was developed there. That was the basis for a commercial product eventually that, uh, that, 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 that surfaced in a company called Garlic that was then acquired by Experian, the credit scoring uh, company. But we were doing things like... Uh, Early social graph analysis, that's a community of practice where we're looking at all the data we have from the publication databases. We tended to use ourselves as an academic community uh, as the experimental kind of guinea pig in this case because we had access to the data. It was and still remains a challenge to get some of the data at scale, but our own publications and our own kind of project engagements were something that we could freely get and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and experiment with. And that was a formulation... Uh, to attempt to understand the co-publishing network, the network of co-workers in a domain. Very well suited to the kind of representations that I, I mentioned earlier on in AI. And this was kind of the, 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 the piece de resistance. In about 2003, we, uh, we imagined a semantic web which did not yet exist in which we would be able to integrate heterogeneous information from a wide variety of sources and um, almost, almost kind of treat the web as a distributed knowledge base. But of course, people weren't using linked data back in the day, so what we did was collected a whole range of harvesting um, content from around the websites of all the departments of computer science in the country. We've been this thing called CS Active Space. It was based fundamentally an RDF-based, a graph-based representation of the world of computing. And within that, uh, what we did is we provided kind of a situational awareness system. So you could, um, you don't see all of this, but you could actually, and you won't see any of it because the graphic's not rendering. That's really tedious. There you go. Okay, why isn't that happening? Okay. Um, I, I, I thought at least, uh, let me see if that will play. But I can just dully present the... You really don't want to see that running at the speed. Okay, okay, there you go. Okay, it's catching up gradually. So the idea was that you could move your cursor around over some part of the UK, designate an area, and get all sorts of information back. Look at the resolution on that. It's VGA for you, sorry. Um, but what it's showing you is information about an individual, uh, what's going on in a, in, a, in a radius. There's a bunch of researchers being returned there. Actually, that's me at the top, with a bunch of attributes. And... This presentation was essentially powered underneath by RDF, the triple store, the raw representation for this domain we can see here as we browse through the triple store browser. That is the worst resolution I've ever seen, I have to say. Uh, no HDMI cable, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, there, there it was. Um, a representation in terms of fundamental triples, an ontology at the background, it was all very clean and dandy. And we were very much enjoying ourselves as engineers building these first things. We were promoting uh, this whole idea of a linked data set of principles. In 2006, Tim and I uh, revisited, along with Wendy Hall, the, the semantic web, re-presented the fundamental principles of um, um, uh, persistent identifiers uh, using URIs, uh, dereferenceable URIs, and, 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 and kind of holding up the claim that the key would be to represent your world in terms of these persistent identifiers and link, link, link. And that got interest. You know, in 2005, we began our first work with the, um, with the public sector data set. So this was work where we took data from lots of London authorities and services and uh, began to triplify them, put them in graph stores. And uh, indeed, that work got represented to Parliament in 2007. And it was that work 
that Tim had remembered we were doing, and when he had this uh, momentary encounter with the then Prime Minister Gordon Brown, who said, what can I do to exploit the web? He said, uh, put your data on it in the disarming way that Tim does. And in the rather disarming way that Brown does, he said, OK. okay. <laughs> um, what, uh, so we had this fantastic period of chasing around in 2009, uh, just turning up to these kind of departments and secretaries of state and saying, put your data on the, on the web, the prime minister says. Um, and, and, it, and it led to, to some real changes. And there was a whole kind of um, climate of interest around open data, pushing as many of these non-personal data sets online as possible. We set up data.gov.uk. Those days, we saw this very much as a portal where you could um, deposit large amounts of public sector data, ideally, as we'll come and see, in a nice linked data form. And progress was made. We, have, we still have to this day police.uk, which is all the reported crime data uh, for any particular zone and place. Um, and this was sensitive data. You know, this was data that would pinpoint where exactly um, um, issues were occurring. Chief constables weren't comfortable with it. The IT uh, couldn't cope when they put this site up. There was so much demand for it that all the servers melted immediately. <laughs> Literally, they had no idea of uh, load management, because uh, no government website had ever been popular to that extent in the past. <laughs> no, that's probably a bit cruel. No, it's not. It's absolutely true. Um, um, so we, we've, you know, th those kind of examples, um, the examples we've had in the environmental data, the fact we now have routinely real-time data on things like r river level heights. You'd think, well, God, we've always had that. And we, have, we had it, but it wasn't available for public scrutiny. It wasn't available as, as real-time feeds. Uh, excitingly, in the last uh, few years, we've had, um, for example, in the health service, so there's environmental data, we've had uh, policing data. Um, health data, this is the fact that every GP in England has to publish every month the prescriptions they write out. Not to who, but what the drug was for what condition. That's an extraordinary resource. So it's allowed us to build services. People like Ben Goldacre are out there building services to inspect what the prescribing habits across an entire health system are from postcode to postcode, from drug type to drug type. And it, it led to some early celebrated successes when the ODI launched um, over five years ago now. One of our lead stories was this recognition that it looked like we were over-prescribing patented heart drugs, things that lower blood pressure, to the extent of £200 million a year when you could have used a white label, basically off-patent drug equivalent. I mean, that's really been a measure of success, we feel. And also, you know, postcode variations. Why is this practice or this um, authority issuing this kind of drug? Or why is it taking so long for advice from NICE, for example, to catch up with practice? So these are very material um, uh, effects. So when the ODI was set up, our whole mission was about um, trying to build and exploit the value of open data. Over the last five years, in truth, we've expanded that to incorporate the whole ecosystem. So we think it's really crucial that we understand how the spectrum of data from open to shared to closed operates, how the uh, realities of working across those varieties of data is going to be operationalized, uh, and also to actually talk seriously about what, of course, in the, hay, in the high day of kind of opening all the data up, people said, yeah, but what are, are there downsides? Uh, are, could there be harmful effects of all of this data potentially triangulating individuals or, or kind of in other ways giving too much? Well, we're very aware of that uh, conversation nowadays in the notion of profiling. Um, so it's important that when we do our work with data, we understand these value-driven aspects. But what I want to kind of talk about the remainder of my slot is this idea of data as infrastructure. Because I think it's important, and I think we have not got there. But despite these, these successes I can point to of data released here and there, there's a concept here that I want to play, play on, which is the idea of data as infrastructure. 2015, we began to introduce this concept, talk about it. Um, um, Prospect magazine led off on this. It's been interesting to see the uh, National Infrastructure Commission now, now talks about this. What do we mean? 
But when we think of an infrastructure, physical infrastructure, like a railway or electrical grid, we, we have some expectation that certain characteristics hold for that data. Ideally, that it's reliable, although they wouldn't have thought so coming on the tube today. I have to say, it was a bit of a nightmare experience. Uh, often those aren't technical issues. Uh, sometimes they're human and socio-technical issues. But reliability is what you demand. Degree of safety, high quality, reproducibility, a degree of governance on top, interoperability between regions, zones, and services that you've got some economic advantage investing in this, like market access or economies of scale or the ability to innovate, and that you make sensible decisions about what infrastructural features will give you those properties. So if we think about them in terms of rail gauges or signaling or distribution on the electrical grid, is that a good analogy as we read across? Well, you'd think so, right? So what's it going to mean to talk about data as infrastructure? We made an attempt in the early days of open data. We were pushing very strong for the linked five-star, the five-star road to perfection, which was um, you know, build your data as linked data and even give it a sparkle endpoint. That's, that's the really shiny high-end stuff. Um, but we do see, even now, some of our um, governmental agencies, arms length agencies, <clears throat> for example, the Ordnance Survey, the Geospatial um, Authority in the UK, producing high-quality linked data. Linked data which is maintained, relates to an authoritative part of the United Kingdom. And in this case, it's the digital realisation of things like uh, administrative boundaries or postcodes. So every postcode has a URI, or every administrative area has a URI, or every major road would have a URI. And these are an analogues. They're kind of digital twins to the real things that matter in your real world. Now, agencies like the Ordnance Survey need funding and resources and sustainable engineering to keep that stuff current and fresh. We rather hoped, Tim and I, back in the day, that this would be how a lot of governmental material would eventually be surfaced. It hasn't happened quite that way. Okay. Um, and I think it's unfinished business. You can see, um, you can see islands of of, of uh, high ambition. The land registry, for example, that keeps all of our um, um, cadastral information, who owns what, their linked data project, even as a sparkle endpoint, it'll give you the kind of latest price uh, paid for, um, for, for, for housing in an area, for example. But it's very isolated. Okay. Um, you've got people like Companies House who have, a, who have doctrine on how you should name and give URIs to the companies that are constituted uh, in, on the United Kingdom Register of Legal Companies. You've got people like Open Corporates um, who are moving to this whole idea of an application programming, a programmatic interface to get to the data. Now, that's another kind of infrastructure. If you build the API, and of course, the paradigmatic example of that, you might say, would be what Transport for London have done with their Transport API. And there's a great example where a relatively simple set of verbs and retrieval functions across the underlying real-time data has allowed large amounts of innovation to flourish. And uh, City Mapper saved my bacon today, gave me another route through. But they're just one example of that, that, that use. Of course, that's not the portalization of the data. That's a different mode of delivery. But the effort that is invested to keep that data live and current, the fact that I can generate URLs off the back of many of the elements in there seems to me a very interesting feature. So the National Infrastructure Commission talks about data for the public good. We had the ambition in the linked open data cloud of beginning to connect these islands of persistent high quality data. I think the jury's out on that. You know, I think we're looking at much more pragmatic use of elements of the, of the data representations that we're able to surface in this important infrastructure. So for me, the challenge is all about how we build infrastructure data for everything from personal data to network data to asset data to organizational data, housing, roads, location, operational system resilience, schedules, traffic flows, emissions, personal data appropriately anonymized from consumption to location, 
these things deserve uh, attention and work to build uh, agreements around vocabularies, URI conventions, for example. And that is unfinished business. It's barely begun in some areas. You can still be scrabbling around for what constitutes an uh, open data output, and it's a CSV file, essentially. You know, it's not much more uh, structure to it than that. Um, very useful, but often the, um, the elements in the CSV files don't, don't dereference themselves, they're not your eyes themselves. So we've got a lot of work to do. There are indications that, so, that there's, there's enough programmatic interest in other areas to do this. So you may have heard of the concept of the digital twin. As we build our physical infrastructures, can we build a digital analog or a twin that allows us to experiment in silico on the services or the nature of that uh, actual infrastructure? Well, that's going to require just the kinds of infrastructure elements I was talking about. So here's the challenge to uh, you and us as a community. What are we going to need to do with our data to turn it into a reliable infrastructure? How do we make it repeatable uh, and robust and enduring, efficient, scalable, transparent, secure? Can it be repurposed? Has it got sufficient metadata associated with it, in particular provenance data, so that we have some confidence that it's coming from where we thought it uh, should have come from and that it's been through a particular uh, um, uh, sequence of processes and, um, and controls? And when, we build our abstract, and when we build our infrastructures, are we thinking about the right levels of abstraction? Do we put enough thought into the conceptual modelling of how these domains could and should work as sustainable infrastructures? And these are fundamental ideas from software engineering. I think that very often when our policymakers are thinking about the, uh, the kind of power or the utility of open data, job's done when you publish the kind of spreadsheet. There's so much more that we've got to do. And I think that's been one of the reasons why we might have seen the relatively um, fragmented take-up of the linked data story. I'm sure that with a whole range of new challenges ahead of us, we're going to see new opportunities there. So finally, I'd, I'd like to kind of really get into the questions around this, actually. Just to note, there are in very substantial challenges to us as we think about the linked data space, even as an engineered infrastructure, because it won't be the case that all of your infrastructure necessarily has a completely disclosed open function. Some of it may be regarded as a critical national infrastructure and require some secure handling. Others of it may be genuinely closed. So we've then got to think about how our technologies will allow us to blend across and bleed across those various levels of access control. And I haven't even begun to talk about the challenge presented by personal data in this linked data space, but that's another keynote, I suspect. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the talk. Any questions? Yes. I started last time. So. Hi, Nigel. Hello, um, Paul. So question I have, do you see a role for public-private partnerships in providing these sorts of data infrastructures? We see that in other infrastructure mm, space. Yeah. Do you see the same role here? I do. I, I, think it, I think it isn't being promoted uh, in quite this way. It'd be great if it was. So I think it's happened um, in a few areas. I'll work with Thomson Reuters on, on PermIDs, perm which was a good example. So these are big catalogues of financial product and services identifiers, which have previously been sold out as commercial products and are now available as, 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 as open ID, ID registers. Um, I think there's exactly a role. And again, there the argument is to persuade the private uh, function, uh, companies in some cases that certain parts of this infrastructure will do them very well if it's made openly accessible and available as well. Yeah, uh, But I'm sure there's going to be areas where, and we see that already in some of the transport domains, I think you see that. Yeah. Um, sh sh my turn? All right. So I'm an aerospace engineer. I apply linked data in engineering and I love linked data. I would like to see more adoption of linked data. My concern is that if we focus on government data, 
which would help governments make decisions, that it's a very small group of persons who would benefit from, from linked data. My feeling is that yeah. domains like healthcare, for yeah. example, where yeah. we, we're dealing with closed data, mm -hmm. or even engineering, or mm -hmm. other industries, they offer more opportunities, I think, to really get value of linked data, because the targeted groups are much larger than, than governments. And um, so my idea is, in order to promote linked data and get faster adoption, maybe we should think about other targets than, than yeah. governments. No, I wouldn't, dis I wouldn't disagree that um, there are really important sectors that uh, are outside government. Uh, government is the one that we were, we were, we, we happened historically to push quite hard. And, and there the thought, this wasn't for government's primary, I mean, government did consume its own data, that was always a hope and ambition, departments and public sector services should consume their own data, but it was also as a way to kind of communicate the data out on various uh, citizen-facing or consumer-facing uh, services. But I think you're right, in, in everything from drug design to jet design, you could argue that there's, there's huge opportunities there. Um, I think that exactly mirrors the experience we, we had when we came from, uh, from uh, knowledge engineering and expert systems. See, the thing that intrigues me is, is in, the, in the rush to kind of web, the web scale, we've, we've lost a lot of the memory of where some very, very powerful um, knowledge engineering methodologies sat, which are very well suited to kind of characterization in the data form. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm just wondering whether we need an expert system to look after this. My concern, you've got these things on the left when you talk about efficiency and reliability. Mm. And given that data degrades, given that semantics drift, um, the problem's just going to get bigger and bigger. Mm. And I think that's one mm. reason why we haven't mm. seen much of it mm. is because of the energy mm. required to maintain the existing database. So do you see a role mm. for tooling to actually assist that and make that more efficient for the average person. Yeah, and if you, if you take examples like the geospatial data, that's a big set of uh, data which is changing. It changes as you issue new postcodes, new addresses, new, and there's a sense in which that investment um, is a serious one. It can be a bit daunting. We tend to have this view, or I've certainly seen it in some policy areas, that somehow the data will take care of itself. You know, why, why have I got to build this massive maintenance overhead in? It just seems to scare people. I think the role for tooling, for automated checking and verification or updating or, or certification of data, you know, what's the metadata characteristics? Are they current? When was it last revisited? These could all be very helpful. Um, again, can you make that tooling generic? Um, and we may be able to learn lessons from, you know, people talk about code as infrastructure. They're starting to think about what the automation of these bases of essentially um, data are. Um, can we carry some of those across? I, I'd still like to see um, just a higher level of, of software engineering within sectors that have large data assets but spend an awful lot of time dealing with just this, this fact, because the investment in fundamentally re-engineering for maintenance, re-engineering for, 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 for maintenance is, is, is a key challenge. Yeah. Hello. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, do you think there's a role for uh, approval of data? I'm very conscious of as data gets more um, sort of publicized and used in training data sets for some of the machine learning models, the context of which data is captured uh, mm. is so critical so that we don't get the biases. Do you think there's a, uh, data should only be used in certain circumstances and have some degree of approval? In other contexts, I've been arguing, when people say, ah, oh, the robots will take our jobs or the algorithms will put us out of work, I say, you haven't thought about the new professional cadres that will have to be evolved. So data auditing is just one example, I think. I think we will see and need and require some guarantees about the nature and quality, uh, to, to, to the last point, really, um, about what constitutes a database that is, in some sense, fit for purpose. We see that at the moment, of course, in a slightly different way, in the, in the worry people have around algorithmic training data sets, where, which may have bias or, bias or sampling issues associated with them. And so to, be, to, be, to, be, to, be, um, to have a framework where you can address what is it to have the right hallmarks of a 
decent data set, and that will be quite context specific. I mean, you'd like, of course, to understand when you're deploying these things as, uh, for example, if I want to, um, to some bodies to issue this knowledge or, or data already have a statutory obligation that it should be you know, up to date, uh, as good as possible. Um, uh, other areas, we don't have that. So I think these twin tracks are kind of a, a duty of care and also um, the auditing process um, would be a very important. It, it will be a profession I think we'll see emerge. Yeah. Yep. Hi, Nigel. So I guess in the life science domain where, where I work and have worked for a while, I think there's, there is a lot of link to answer another question that came up. I think there's a lot of linked data in this space. It's, it's an area I've worked in for quite a while. There's tons done in RDF. There's yeah. a lot. I think one of the key successes we've had is, number one, there's a lot of data in the public domain. So there's a lot to play with. But number two, it's a lot of it's really well curated mm. because there's been a lot of people involved in yep. making good quality data. And you yep. need that to get yep. good linked data. So I guess the question is, in other sectors, how do we transfer mm. that when there's no funding typically to hire curators well, for tidying and, and doing the data carpentry yeah, on that stuff? Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that, that, would, that, that is exactly the best practice we've somehow got to expose, it seems to me. And how do we do it? Where do we get the funding to do it? It's not the first most attractive, sexy thing to do, is it? And, and, yet, and yet it's there. Um, and, you know... It's great to know that and hear that, and, 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 and in some domains, just the sheer investment in, in vocabulary management and the agreements on standards, the, the work you're talking about there, hugely impressive. But you know, what, is the exact, what is the readout or the analogy into another sector that's got all those same demand characteristics? And where's the guiding mind for that when we kind of try and think of, of, of best use? I think that would be a great thing for, uh, for, for, for a community like this to try and sit down and work out what could it do. Don't have the answers on that. Well, yeah. come and talk to the ODI as well. I mean, the ODI, honestly, that, that is one of the things that we are meant to be trying to get our, wrap our head around here. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so one last question. And, and is there research or evidence around the economic benefit being generated related to the cost of investment around providing all this open access to mm. data sets? Mm. Yeah, that's always been a demand. You know, where's the return on investment? Um, actually, doing the economics on this is, again, it's a bit like maintenance. It's, it's quite expensive. It's often done after the fact. It's not instrumented from the beginning. Um, you know, famously, I can point to... So what's, what's, what, what's the biggest open data example you can think of that's generated value? I'd say with the human genome, right? They, they actually did a, an experiment where they worked out what the cost of opening that up, because it was being patented at one stage, if you might, will recall. When they kind of open that up as a construct, that's generated trillions. But, you know, or you could take examples from more modest examples like Transport for London. It opening up their transport data, they think, is a 36 to 1 return on, 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 on the value. Now, you know, is that good enough or bad enough? But it's, it's, it's tens of millions of pounds in that case. Um, and that, there are just a few examples where they've actually put in the instrumentation at the beginning at the end to kind of see this is what we think we're saving. So not in every case. Uh, in some cases, the benefits are, are further out, one suspects, or they're second-order effects. Um, what is the benefit in the second-order effect of people using a product like CityMapper and other things to get themselves efficiently around the London? Well, it's a damn sight more than the, just, the, just the foregone costs from transport to London having to do it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, thanks a lot. Right. And yeah, that, that wraps up the, uh, the keynotes. We'll have a short break. <laughs>